Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much that we were able to come here, that you want us to come here and just worship you. Father, we thank you and gather together as a family and just worship you, lift up how amazing and great you are. Father, we thank you that we can do that as a family. Father, I thank you so much for our undefeated. I thank you for their hearts. I thank you for what you're doing through uh, these young men and women. And Father, we just thank you so much just for allowing us to be here this morning, to hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. That was awesome. Thanks, Meredith. Thanks, Christian. So this is Palm Sunday. Um, we'll be reading John 12, 12 through 19. I believe that's on the screen. John 12, 12 through 19. We'll also be reading Zechariah 9, 8 through 10. You'll understand why we're reading Zechariah in a few minutes. Um, Palm Sunday, this is one of these weeks where it's kind of like Christmas, kind of like Easter, where um, it is the, the same story, but it's a very important story. And uh, I actually had a pastor call me earlier this week, and, and it's, he's only been a pastor for a couple of years, and he's really struggling with, what do I do with Palm Sunday? It's like, it's the same story we did the last couple of weeks. I'm like, okay, I know a pastor that's been a pastor for 38 years, and uh, he bring something different, something new, something fresh to the Palm Sunday story and the Easter story and the Christmas story every year. These are powerful stories. It, Palm Sunday is a huge day in the life of Jesus. And Palm Sunday should be a huge day in the life of a Christian, in the life of, of you and me. So much happened on this day. So much important information happened on this day. And so much happens in this coming week. Today kicks off Holy Week. We're now into Holy Week. There's a lot that goes on this week. Palm Sunday, some people refer to it as Triumphal Entry Sunday. It's a story of Jesus entering Jerusalem as a king. It's a powerful story. It's written about in all four of the Gospel books. Let's set the stage. Before we read this morning's scripture, I always say you really can't just read a scripture. You have to set the stage a little bit. You have to know the context of it. Who's speaking? Okay, who wrote the book of John? Who, who's he speaking to matters. What's going on in the world on that day? Why does he have to share this information? Why does he write down the little details that he writes down? What's going on at this point in time that he needs to share the story with us? That's all important context. That's all important when we want to read scripture. The book of John, obviously written by one of the 12 hand-picked disciples, the beloved disciple, the scripture calls him. I believe the book of John is a little bit different than the other four gospels. I think the book of John is a little bit more personal. When somebody says to me, where should I start reading the Bible? I always say, why don't you start in John? I think he typically shares more details in certain areas. In certain areas, I believe John really um, makes us think about Jesus. And he really makes us think about what we think about Jesus. Not just who Jesus was and is, but who he is to us. And I think John really pulls that out in his writings. So let's set the stage before we actually read this. Um, what happened just before Palm Sunday? What happened these days leading up to Palm Sunday? So important. What happened just before the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem? Well, if you go back in time, just a few days, um, you'll read the story of Lazarus, dead, Jesus' friend, dead, buried, and uh, Jesus raised him from the dead. Jesus went there with Mary and Martha, and he, he raised Lazarus. You can remember the story. And there's, there was huge crowds that were there, and the crowds continued to grow. Because Jesus just raised somebody from the dead. Word spread pretty fast about this. So the crowd's growing. The crowd's growing. This, they, people wanted to see Lazarus, this man that was risen from the dead. And they wanted to see Jesus, the man that raised him from the dead. They're curious. They want to see. They've heard the stories. He's got this following. It's growing and growing. The Jewish leaders were there as well. By this point in time, we, we've talked about this all the time. The Jewish leaders are there in the background. They're watching. They're paying attention to what's going on. They see these miracles. They, they see what's going on. They see the crowd building. So at this point in time, Jesus tries to lay low a little bit. He goes to the house of Mary and Martha. And he, he, and he, he tries to lay low with the crowds following. The crowds just stay with him. you got to understand what's going on here. The Jews at this point in time, they're looking for a king. A real king. The 
free them from Rome. And Passover was coming. At this point in history, the, the Jews were, there was a lot of murmur every year that really wanted to be set free from the control of Rome. Was Jesus that king that would free them? Was Jesus the king that was going to make things right again? Did the Jews believe that, that Jesus would free them on this Passover day? Like God did in the first Passover. All these questions, all these hopes the Jews had. They had them in Jesus. So Jesus left the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha and Bethany and he headed to Jerusalem. And this is where we pick up this morning's retelling, first hand retelling of the story. John 12, 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and they went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, verse 15, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Verse 16, At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Verse 17, now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Blessed be the reading of the word. Let's pray and then we'll dig in. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Father, we thank I thank you so much for able to come here and worship you openly, freely. We're here because we want to be here. We want to know more, more about you. Father, I pray that each and every person that's here right now can forget about what's going on in our lives, forget about the busyness of our world, the pains and confusions and questions in our own world. Father, I pray that each one of us can just focus on you and what it is you have for us this morning. We don't just hear it, but we listen, we apply it to our lives, and we turn around and we share it with those around us. Father, finally allow me to speak accurately and clearly the truth you laid in my heart to share with this family this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So triumphal entry Sunday, Palm Sunday. A lot happens in this week. I, I don't feel like me. I always like to wonder why. What, what happened here? So what happens between this week? There are so many sermons that we could do, so many lessons, so much teaching this week that occurred today when Jesus rides into Jerusalem as his king. On Thursday night and Friday when they want him dead. What happens this week? Everyone's praising Jesus, shouting, Hosanna, here's our king. What happened over the next few days? What did Jesus do? What did he say to his followers during this week, during these next few days? That would turn him against them so turn them against him so quickly. On Sunday they're praising him. This large crowd is laying down their, their coats for him to walk on, the scripture says. And think about that. Here's a, a lesson I've read the scripture so many times I never really pulled this out before. Okay, what did a coat mean back in these days? A cloak. It was important. The coat or cloak you wore, it was very important. It said a lot about you. Okay, the outer garment that you wore, it was an extension of your personality. It was who I am. It had a lot to do with, this is me, look. I was a technicolor coat, Joseph coat. Codes in this day, they meant something to people. Said a lot about who they were, about their identity. And here these people are, they see Jesus riding the town on a donkey, and they're taking off their identity and throwing it at Jesus' feet. There's a lesson in itself. We could do the whole message on that. That's where we ended up last week, throwing our identity down, humbling ourselves for, for him. That's what's going on here. And they're also waving these palm branches. They're waving these palm branches around. And it seems crazy, but that's, that's how it is. That was a symbol that here comes a king. That's what they would normally do when a king returns home victorious from battle. That's what's going on here. 
What caused them by the end of the week to turn? What goes wrong during this week that causes Jesus to find himself betrayed by, his, by one of his own disciples? Arrested by the high priests and guards? Accused by a coalition of religious leaders? Tried by the Roman governor? Sentenced to die the death of a common criminal on a cross? His crucifixion? All within a week. Why did it happen? How did this happen? What caused the same people who are cheering him on Sunday to gather a few days later and yell, crucify him? Whenever I have a question, I always turn to the Bible for answers. And there's other, there's other texts and there's other, um, other writings that you can turn to as well that run parallel with the Bible. There's other teachings out there. There's other um, sources that we can turn to um, to learn about history outside of the Bible. Now, I'm not a big fan of history, if you know me at all. I'm not real big on names and dates. But it's really important to know this stuff. It's really important to, to get the gist of what's going on in history. It's important. We have to learn history. We have to know history to understand today and what's happening today. Jesus' procession into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the Triumphal Sunday, that was not the only procession that occurred in the city that week, possibly that very day. Roman historians record the fact that the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, led a procession of Roman cavalry soldiers, some on foot, some on horseback. He led them into Jerusalem possibly the same day. This was the cavalry, this, the centurions. Imagine the spectacle of the entry of Pontius Pilate into Jerusalem. It is written that he came in from the, from the western side of the city. The opposite side from which Jesus came in. We know where Jesus came in. We can read in Scripture. Pontius Pilate is leading these soldiers on foot, on horseback. This procession of power and strength. Each soldier dressed in full armor, helmets, shields, body armor. Some had swords, some had spears, some had bows, some had slings of arrows. It would be very typical to have a, a drummer beating out a cadence as they marched into town. This was no ordinary entry into Jerusalem. Pilate was governor of the, a huge region, not just Judea and Samaria, but Idumea also in other areas. And it was a very standard practice in these days to have the Roman governor of that land to come to the land's capital for these major religious celebrations. And this is the beginning of Passover, this Jewish festival that the Romans allowed. Passover is a, a festival that celebrates the freedom of the Jews from another empire. It commemorates the, the Jews' freedom from the Egyptian empire generations ago. The Romans occupied this land, Jerusalem, and this land for about 80-some years, over 80 years. They, they conquered the Jews. They overtook the land. And there were so many people that they allowed the religious leaders to control the people. And then they oversaw the religious leaders. So they were really in control. The Romans were really in control of this area. But then you had these religious leaders under there that thought they were in control. They had a lot of freedom as long as they stayed within the walls of the tank, sort of, if you can picture it that way. Romans were always aware there was always these rumors <clears throat> of threats, always rumors of these uprising, especially around the Passover season. This is why Pilate had to be there. This is why Pilate had to be there with a show of force, just to remind the Jewish people who is really in control of their city. The Romans would not tolerate any form of rebellion. And so on this occasion, Pilate had traveled with this large group of Romans' finest soldiers from his headquarters to the capital, Jerusalem. Pilate's entry into Jerusalem was also meant to send a message to the Jews and to all those who might be plotting this rebellion against Rome. It was meant to intimidate the citizens of Jerusalem so that they might think twice about joining in or planning some kind of rebellion. So with a show of military power, human strength and dominance, Pilate and his men entered Jerusalem. That's great. <laughs> Just saying. The entry of Jesus 
was basically the opposite of Pilate's entry. As we just read, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, not even on a horse. He had no army, he had no weapons, he had no display of power. And then we get this quote from the Old Testament, the prophet Zechariah, written over 500 years before Jesus is even born. He quotes the ninth chapter of Zechariah. Let's read the John version again. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. There's much more to that line, much more to that scripture than just the mode of transportation that Jesus is coming into town on. He's saying, here comes your king. He's quoting this Old Testament scripture. We have to go back and read what the prophet Zechariah says. What did he speak to the nation? Zechariah 9, the prophet reassures the people of Judea that God has not forgotten them. Let's read this, Zechariah. Let's back up one verse to get the text of it, to see what's going on in the context. Again, this is written over 500 years before Jesus is born. Zechariah 9, verse 8. But I will defend my house against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people. For now, I am keeping watch. Verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Verse 10. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. And the battle bow will be broken. He, this guy riding in on the donkey, he will claim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. When the people watching Jesus ride in on the donkey, when they heard this, what they heard was God will deliver their nation from the oppressors. That's what the scripture is saying. In this case from Rome. According to the prophet Zechariah 500 years before, the king they seek will come to them humbly, not on a war horse, but on a slow moving donkey, the symbol of a king who comes in peace. According to Zechariah, Jesus knew this. He quotes the scripture. I think it's interesting. Show me another place in the Bible where, where Jesus rides on a horse or a donkey. Anytime. Anywhere for any reason. He saved it for this day. He's fulfilling scripture on this day, on Palm Sunday. I didn't find it in the Bible. You can go and look this week. He rides into Jerusalem. The only time he ever rode on a donkey is when he rides into Jerusalem saying, Your king is here. Here, here comes the king. The two processions, the two parades could not be more different as they entered Jerusalem. And the message they had to convey could not be more different. Pilate, leading the Roman centurion, shows off power and strength of the Roman Empire, letting folks know that they will crush all who oppose them, versus Jesus riding his young donkey, displaying peace to all nations, as Scripture says, through truth and love, bringing righteousness and salvation. Those who see these two opposing processions with two very different options, must make a choice. They will either serve the God of this world, serve man, man-made power, man-made rules and laws, man-made serve the desires of the flesh, or they will choose to serve this king of a very different kingdom, the kingdom of God. We know that on Sunday, large crowds chose Jesus on Sunday. They chose to welcome Jesus triumphantly into Jerusalem. And it's important to notice that the crowds proclaim Hosanna to the son of David. We heard a little extra teaching about coats. We heard a little extra teaching about the donkey. Here's another one, the son of David. The Jewish people, they're placing their faith and trust in, in Jesus that he would return the nation to when the mighty King David ruled. He would restore Jesus would restore the glory to the way it was back when King David ruled. That's what the Jews wanted. 
They wanted a Messiah. They wanted a Messiah that would bring back the glory of Israel. They wanted a king who would rid this nation of oppressors. They wanted a strong and mighty king by worldly standards. They praised him. They followed him to the city. They followed him through the next couple of days to the temple. They heard him preach. They saw him teach. They saw him perform miracles. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But by the end of the week, things had changed. Jesus made no moves to overthrow the Romans. Jesus seemingly let them down and made them angry to the point where they started to turn on him. Even those closest to Jesus, the 12 disciples, would either betray him or outright abandon him or hide or deny that they even knew him within just a few days. Why? What turned the followers against Jesus? Maybe some were confused. Maybe some were in fear. Maybe some were believing the lies. Maybe some had unbelief. Maybe some had doubt. What did happen? Well, we know from Scripture that Jesus challenged the rulers of Judea. Jesus challenged these Pharisees and Sadducees. He, he challenged them. Not the Romans, but these local religious leaders. He said to them that the temple was not the only way to find God's forgiveness. And further, that the temple would be destroyed with not one stone left on another. That's what Jesus told the religious leaders. That probably didn't fly very well, right? Of course, those who, who made their living from the temple, the scribes, the chief priests, the high priests, the ruling council of the Sanhedrin, the religious parties, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they would all lose their power. They would all lose their prestige if there's no temple. They would all lose their power and prestige if there's no people to lead. They're all following Jesus now. These leaders felt threatened by Jesus. If Jesus was correct, they were no longer needed. They didn't understand Jesus. They didn't understand who he was, what he was saying. They're basically intimidated, scared of him, scared of the movement. You don't like what you don't understand. So when Jesus would perform miracles one after another, and then Jesus would tell these healed people, your sins are forgiven. He was blatantly challenging the authority of the entire temple system. The Jewish leader, leaders considered Jesus' words to be blasphemy, punishable by death. And then it got worse. This week, Jesus will drive the money changers from the temple, saying that the temple was to be a house of prayer, but that the religious leaders had made it a den of thieves. Jesus exposed the corruption in the temple and the corruption of the temple tax system. Jesus angered many people by simply sharing truth, by simply exposing lies. How often does that happen to us? You just share truth with somebody, all of a sudden you're just like, you can fill in the names. Bigot, intolerant, self-righteous. Jesus angered many people by sharing truth and just trying to show them there's another way to live. I have a different way for you to live. He angered many people by trying to share God's new plan with them. And it gets worse. The Jewish leaders had developed this safe and comfortable working relationship with Rome. I touched on it a little bit. Okay, the Jewish leaders, they had these certain rights and freedoms and powers as long as they, to do their religion, as long as they did what the Roman leaders wanted them to do. They could pretty much get away with quite a bit as long as they stayed within the guidelines and rules of the Roman, the Roman Empire. But Jesus and his followers were a threat to their comfortable way of life. This is important. They did not want Jesus to rock the boat. They didn't want Jesus to, do it, to ruin this good thing that they had going on. Take away their power, the prestige, the money, the protection, the, the feeling of being free even though they really weren't. So these Jewish leaders know that Jesus must be removed. His movement must be halted, stopped. His followers must be stopped. Or better yet, the leaders needed to try and show that Jesus was not the king. They needed to show the people Jesus is not the Messiah. They must convince the followers of Jesus that this Jesus, he is not the savior he says he is. He's a liar. 
He's not the man you're looking for. He's not the one we should put our hope and trust in. We can learn this by reading John 11, 45. This is just before the scripture we already read this morning. John eleven forty five. 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisee and told them what Jesus had done, just raised Lazarus from the dead. Verse 47, then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting in the Sanhedrin. That's the whole religious council. They're all together, all the big monkey monks, they're all there. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. Verse 48, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Roman guards will come and take away both our temple and our nation. If we allow Jesus to keep doing what he's doing, we're going to lose it all. The Romans are going to say, these guys aren't in charge of anyone anymore. Let's get them out of here. We don't need these people anymore, these religious leaders. Right there shows us how threatened these Jewish leaders were. They felt that Jesus needed to be stopped. Verse 49, then one of them named Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. They felt that Jesus needed to die so that their way of, so that their way of life could be maintained, so that their nation could continue as it is, unchanged. So these officials, they come up with a plot to kill Jesus. They plan to come up with charges against Jesus. And then these, these charges, these lies spread throughout the, the people, throughout the followers of Jesus, that this man, Jesus, he's no king, he's a liar. They try to discredit him and it begins to work. The lies, the murmur, evilness works through the crowd, spread like hot gossip through the city, through the followers of Jesus. Soon they all turn on Jesus. Based on the lies of being told about Jesus, they began to doubt who Jesus really was. They start to feel that he's not this powerful king by earthly standards that they were looking for. He's got no army. He didn't even resist. He didn't try to be free. It made no sense to his past followers that this strong, powerful king, that this Messiah, this deliverer, he wouldn't even fight back when he got arrested. He just went with them. Put away your sword. Here's the problem. The followers of Jesus, in their minds, Jesus never did what they wanted him to do. That's why they stopped following him. He didn't do what they wanted. Jesus never defeated the Romans. He never even started. He never started to dissolve this unfair tax system. He never put common people in charge of the government. He never freed the people from the oppression of Rome. In their minds, Jesus did not do what they wanted him to do. How will today, how will you, how will me? So many people turn on Jesus. So many people turn on the church. So many people turn on pastors and turn on Christians. They'll fight against you. They'll turn away. Why? Because the church or the pastor or the Christian or Jesus did not do what they wanted him to do. We all have this view of Jesus in our minds. And we want him to back up our little plans. We want him to say, it's okay, continue down that path. I know you're called to pain and suffering. Continue, to, that's what we want Jesus to say. That's what we want other Christians to say. And when we don't hear that, we turn away. Crucify him. How dare you not say what I want you to say? In their minds, they pictured a very different kind of king. They turned from the actual Savior to follow what they thought their king should look like in their own minds. In their minds, Jesus let them down. He didn't help them. In their minds, he was not this powerful king, not the Messiah. They bought into the lives of the world. They quickly forgot the teachings of Jesus that they heard. They quickly forgot all this stuff that they saw. Remember, we just talked about this the last couple of weeks. 
The Bible says over 250 times, remember, don't forget, remember, store these truths up in your heart because you're going to need them someday. Somebody in your life is going to need this truth. In addition, the followers, they, they felt that Jesus was going to make worse, make life worse for them, not better. The religious leaders and the followers all felt this way. If I do what Jesus asked me to do, I'm going to have to change my life. Not only is he not doing what I want him to do, but now I have to change what I'm doing. How the religious leaders, they never agreed on anything. The Pharisees and Sadducees, when you go back in history, um, I hate to say like the Democrats and Republicans, but that's the, the, they were like that. The Pharisees and Sadducees, they could not agree on anything. But here, you can find them agreeing on something. Especially during this Passover season, they got together. And they, they agreed that Jesus was going to draw the attention the Roman leaders. He was going to cause problems for them. They agreed on that. They're afraid that Rome will come down on them and punish them and take away what they have, maybe even kill them. So Jesus is accused by these religious leaders. They have him arrested. They have him brought before Pilate to be punished. When they heard the charges and saw that Jesus had no defense, the angry mob, his former followers, wanted to be rid of him. They now are crucified. So on Palm Sunday, many believe that Jesus was king. They believe that he was a savior, the Messiah. On Sunday, his teachings made sense. They heard all about him. They saw the miracles. They saw the miraculous signs, the wonders. They saw many of that stuff. They followed him. They believed that there was this new way. A way based on loving the Lord first and then loving other people. They believed it. A way not based on religion and laws, but a way based on love and relationship with God through Jesus, through Him. And they listened to all the teachings of Jesus and they believed on Sunday. But in a few short days, their belief and faith wavered and then evaporated as these rumors and murmurs circulated. They began to believe the lies of the world. They began to doubt who Jesus was. They forgot his teachings. Is that us? Is that you and me? We come here on Sunday mornings. We're praising him. We're worshiping him. It all makes sense here. We understand. We get it. It all sounds good. We try to remember the words of Jesus here. But by Friday... Be honest, by Friday, have you allowed the world's view to taint your thinking, to draw you away from Jesus, to influence your decisions? By Friday, have you replaced Jesus with the world? What happened with the crowds that followed Jesus? Well, they turned back to their old way of thinking. They turned back to what they were familiar with, what they were comfortable with, what they've always done. So I agreed, maybe some of them wanted what the world had to offer. Maybe some of them were in fear of what might happen and following Jesus. Some of them were just ignorant. They didn't really know what's going on. Some people just didn't believe. Some people doubted and so on. The Jewish leaders and now the crowds denied Jesus. They, they grew to despise and even hate the name of Jesus because everything he stood for was in direct opposition and a threat to their lifestyle. Is Jesus a threat to your lifestyle? Again, maybe he's not doing what you thought he would do for you, and that's why you turn away. And if you're online watching right now, maybe that's why you're not here this morning, because maybe you just stumbled on this message, but maybe that's why you gave up on church. Maybe that's why you gave up on Christians even, because Jesus wasn't doing what you wanted him to do. And now for the rest of us, for all of us, Maybe he's a threat to our way of living. Maybe he's a threat to our lifestyle. I do all this stuff. I'm not hurting anybody. Just leave me alone over here. I know this. It says it's a sin. But it's okay. You can't think like that. Does Jesus sound okay here on Sunday mornings? These are really nice stories, really wise teachings. 
Do we really just think that this is a, a great book? I come here on Sundays and I hear this stuff and it makes sense. This knowledge makes sense. This is a really good book to navigate life. If I have a question on marriage, I turn to it. If I have a question on work ethic, I turn to it. But I'm not really going to make changes in my life. Thursday, Friday, I'm not going to do that. Will we believe that what he says is the truth? Will we allow that to change our lives and not be mad at him for it? Will believing in, in what Jesus says, will we, will believing in, in what this Bible says, will that make us uncomfortable, too uncomfortable to, to continue to believe? Many deny Christ. Many would rather shout, crucify him, rather than lay down their own desires. Talked about humility last week. Many people would rather not humble themselves. They would rather turn from the church, turn from truth, so they can continue with their plan. They cannot humble themselves to the truth. It's easier to say crucify him than to bow down. I'm bigger than you are, is what they're actually saying. Sometimes if we just say, I don't believe, I choose not to believe, Sometimes that's easier for the person to just walk away from the church. Well, I don't believe any of it. So step back from it and ask yourself, if you had been in Jerusalem that day and you saw both processions come into town, if you saw both parades pass by, and one filled with worldly strength and power and one filled with Jesus, which parade would you choose to follow? That's the same exact choice that we have to make every single day. There are two parades going in front of us every single day. You can walk by the Spirit or you can walk by the world. Here comes the show of power, all these promises of all this fun and all these things. And then here's Jesus. Do we choose worldly power or real love? Do we choose prestige or humility? Do we choose our way of living, our self-righteousness, or do we choose God's way, God's plan? Do we choose based on feelings, emotions? They'll change before the day's out. Or do we choose, make decisions based on biblical truth, knowledge, and wisdom? Do we choose to follow traditions, or do we choose to follow scripture? Do we choose to listen to the ways of the world or do we choose to listen to the voice of truth? There are two types of possessions. There are two choices that we need to make every single day. The world or Jesus in every area of our life. Which will you choose and why? The Sunday school answer is Jesus. Of course I'll choose Jesus. Press your life up against that. Do your actions say that you choose Jesus? Based on your actions, what parade are you following? If I were to ask your children or your parents, what parade would they say you're following? I urge us all, don't forget this Holy Week. Don't just make this another week. Make this Holy Week stand out. Make it holy, separated from the world for God's use. Make Holy Week holy. Read and pray and listen and seek and store up these truths in your heart. Really, make this week stand out. Make it holy, separated from... It's not another typical week. This is Holy Week. I challenge you, change your life this week. Make those changes this week that we've talked about week after week. Make the change. Come here on Friday night and enjoy the worst, the Good Friday experience. There'll be no message, there'll be no music. It'll be you and God. It'll be as powerful as you make it. Then come here on Saturday, we're gonna listen to, watch the Passion of the Christ the movie, the powerful movie. I've seen it dozens of times, it's still powerful. Every time I watch it, it, it better be. We should never become desensitized to what Jesus did for us. 
On Palm Sunday, the, the Jews shouted, Hosanna! That word comes from, it has a root word that means save. The same root word means save and Hosanna. The Jews wanted Jesus to save them from the Roman rule. Jesus came to save us from our own sins. It's never too late to change. It's never too late to repent. It's never too late to turn away from whatever it is from your plan. Whatever it is that you don't feel like Jesus has done for you, there's nothing, there's a reason. Turn from that. Turn from whatever it is that you're hanging on to that you're not letting go of. Turn to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all you do for us. Father, we thank you that you wrote down your words and that your words mean something. Every word written in here has a plan and a purpose within the word, within the phrase, within the verse, within the lesson. And Father, I thank you so much we can gather together, we can read it, we can discuss it, we can talk about it. Father, I thank you for the Old Testament that sets its foundation for the new. I thank you for the New Testament that shines light into the old. Father, I thank you we can take a story like the Palm Sunday story that we might have heard 38 times. And it's the 39th time that we hear something new that hits us. And Father, I pray that we don't just allow it to hit us and run off. I, I pray we allow it to hit us and sink in. We, we're willing to make the change that we need to make. Because over you, Lord, it'll help people around us. And then it'll help us. Father, I just thank you so much that you want us to know you. You draw us here. You want us to know your truth. We just thank you, Lord, so much that we're able to come here and worship as a family and learn and grow and serve and embrace. We thank you for all this and so much more in Jesus' name.